Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. I do love America. I love it very much. And Rish Outfield. I love chalupas. Chalupa for you, Rish. Congratulations, Big. It's a podcast. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 114. Yeah, I think that's right. What do you say, Oedo D? Yes, 114 is correct, sir. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Thanks for tuning in. And it's October. That's right. The grandest of all the months. Although I think last week's episode didn't hit until October. Yeah. This is the first official October. Story. That's right. That's the unfortunate trouble with going at your own pace. Ah, uh, well. At a medium pace. <clears throat> I. Sir? Spock? We've got a story for you today, folks. It's uh, a creepy little tale called Giving Birth by Philip Roberts. Tell me a bit about Philip, if you would, sir. Is it okay to call him Philip? First, I'm going to kill this fly that is buzzing my head. You'll never do it. Never. <laughs> oh, driving me insane. Even you... more insane. <laughs> oh, here it is. Ah! You know what? <laughs> oh, it's screaming. Put it out of its misery, please. <laughs> ah! You know what's sad is every time there's a fly around, An angel gets its wings. I'll pick up the fly swatter and go around trying to kill them. And as soon as I pick up the fly swatter, my cat looks at me and it's like, starts freaking out like it expects me to come over and start beating it with the fly swatter. I don't know what the deal is with that cat. Why it treats me like I'm a monster. Because you are a monster. Uh, yeah, everybody okay, so knows I'm a monster. Sorry, okay, back to the uh, show. End of the outtake. Ready, go. Oh no, that's all staying in. Tell me a bit about Mr. Roberts. <clears throat> uh, sure. Philip lives in Nashua, New Hampshire, and holds a degree in creative writing from the University of Kansas. As a beginner in the publishing world, he's a member of both the Horror Writers Association and the New England Horror Writers Association, and has numerous short stories published in a variety of publications. More information on his works can be found at philipmroberts.com. Hmm. And who produced today's episode? Today's episode was produced by producer extraordinaire Brian Lincoln. Wow. The Parsec Award winning Brian Lincoln. That's right. When you're good, you're good. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. This is a creepy little tale, and it's coming your way. On the dune, Steve. Yeah. Giving Birth by Philip Roberts My dad taught me carpentry from about as young as I can remember. I'd learned early to respect the spinning blades and the trouble they would cause if a person wasn't careful enough. Age and repetition is a way of dulling a lot of things, including any fear I might have once had each time I ran a piece of wood through the saw blades, until the inevitable occurred, and I cut off my index finger at the knuckle. Oh. I called out to Laura as soon as it happened, and she hauled down the stairs to see me with my hand up, covered in blood. Good Lord, Rudy, where's your finger? She asked me. Five minutes of frantic searching for the lost finger yielded nothing but sawdust and scraps of wood. They ended up just sewing it over, the finger lost. I forgot all about the finger at first. Weeks went by of adjustments to life with only nine fingers, until I happened to lose a piece of wood behind a filing cabinet close to the saw. When I pulled back the cabinet from the wall, I found more than just the bit of wood I'd lost. There, by the base of the wall, the fleshy remains of my finger stared back at me. Only something had started happening to it. I knelt to pick it up, figuring I was only looking at it from an odd angle, but... Holding the severed finger in my hand, I could feel not only the warmth of it, but see the squirming mass of additional flesh growing from the severed base. The top half of the finger looked like it always had before being severed, but the base 
still encrusted with blood, was larger, pinker, a bulb maybe three inches wide sticking to it. This new flesh felt slimy, and it recoiled just a little, quivering beneath my touch. I gently set it down on the table. My gaze jumped between the finger and the stairs leading up to the living room. I wanted to tell someone, felt like I had to tell someone, but at the same time, a little voice made me pause. This did come from me, after all, I thought. Maybe I should look into it a little more, see what's going on. I clicked the light off above the table and backed away. I needed some sleep, could look at things better in the morning. I didn't say a thing to Laura when I slipped into the bed. Wonder whatever did happen to that finger. She said as if plucking the knowledge from my head as she was prone to do. But she couldn't pluck it all, because the real thoughts were too bizarre. Staring at the lump of flesh the next morning, I understood what it would soon become. I could make out the general shape of a hand, additional fingers only small lumps of flesh, but they were growing, getting longer. Would an arm follow? Would the rest of the body be built? And would this body be a copy of myself, or someone else entirely? This freakish event went far beyond my means of dealing with. But something in me deeply feared the idea of going to any form of authority. This, too, my father had taught me, if not intentionally. I didn't share his phobia of authority, but I had to admit a feeling of disquiet each time I saw a cop car driving down the street or saw how much the government took from each paycheck. Six hours passed before Lara arrived home from work, exhausted. Throughout the day, I'd watched the fingers grow longer, narrower, and could see what I thought were fingernails forming at the tips. I can't imagine how to set this up, so I'm not even going to try, I said to her, and watched her bewilderment as she followed me down the stairs and up to the table. Ah! She screamed at first, a gut reaction, caught too off guard by what almost appeared to be a severed hand, but her horror turned curious, eyes roaming intently over the misshapen appendage, seeing the odd quality of the forming flesh. What is this? She asked me. I found my finger last night. Something was growing from it. This is what's been happening all day, probably since I first cut it off. The index finger attracted her attention the most, what had once been part of me, and I knew she could see it. Laura turned from it and started for the stairs. I didn't speak as we stood in the living room, her eyes on the windows in the evening outside, trying to work it through. When she turned to me, she asked, You've never had this happen before, have you? Never. Will it happen again if you cut off something else? I mean, is it you that's causing it? What do you mean? She paced, chewed absently on her thumb. I don't know. Maybe there was some kind of chemical that it fell into, and that's what's causing this. What chemical? It just fell on the floor of the basement. We don't even keep any cleaning supplies down there, and those are the closest to chemicals I can think of that we don't. Well, certainly we don't have anything radioactive, if that's what you're asking. I'm just trying to understand this! She shouted, growing red-faced. Mad at me, it seemed, for having caused it. I want to as well. You don't think this has freaked me out? Cut something else off. Her eyes held me. Cut off what? I don't know. Something small? She followed me into the basement. We both paused to stare at the beginnings of an arm growing from the base of the hand, its skin color almost perfect now, even hair sprouting from the flesh. I took off my shoe and sock on my left foot and held a knife next to the toe beside the pinky. Seemed like the one I'd missed the least was what I figured. The knife was sharp, but it still took a bit of painful cutting to get the toe off completely. The final tear made with a shout of pain and a gush of blood. <laughs> as soon as I held up the severed toe, the insanity of the situation seemed to reach both of us. Laura came to me quickly, holding a towel to my foot, clinging close to me, comforting me. We left the toe on the table beside the hand.
By the time we crawled into bed, Laura's tenderness had faded. She pulled away from me without a word, choosing to sleep on the corner of the bed rather than against me. I could feel the wall she formed, the feeling that she didn't know me anymore, that I'd changed on her. What could I say? I just prayed in the morning there would only be a severed toe and nothing more. I was let down. The change was small but clear, the base of the toe a different color, pulsing with a pink, slimy protrusion of new skin. You need help, Laura whispered to me without getting too close. What are they going to do? Keep cutting off chunks of me to see what they'll do? You think they aren't going to want to experiment with this? Who am I to them? What would stop them from dissecting me? I could almost feel the cold operating table beneath me, the bright lights blinding me, sharp knives hovering above my nude body. The notion didn't seem so far-fetched. I need to get to work, she said as she turned from me. The wall felt almost complete. I wasn't Rudy Marinter anymore. I'd betrayed her by turning into something else. Or maybe she hated more the idea that I'd always been something else. A freak. And she hadn't known to stay away from me. She left me with my severed parts still growing. Perhaps she'd go to the authorities anyway. But no, I didn't think it was her nature to. Only after she left did I really feel the isolation she had bestowed upon me. She would be no more help in this. I considered calling Mason, and maybe I would eventually, but before that I wanted to see what these things were going to do and figure out where I'd go from there. Laura didn't come home that night. I sat before the parts and watched. Time seemed to speed up the process. By late afternoon, half an arm was complete. The foot grew faster than the hand had, stretching upward into a leg. The same question kept coming back to me. What would I do when they finished forming? Would they be identical to me, memories and all? Or would they be like children, discovering the world for the first time? Would I even allow it to finish, to see the duplicates of myself moving and talking? I kept a gun in my house, always had, and when night fell and the beginnings of a chest sprouted from the arm, I decided to go find it. I slept in a chair in the basement, not that I slept very much. Occasionally I'd drift away for a half hour or so, only to snap awake at the wet, sinewy sound the body parts had begun to create. In all of my dreams, I saw these versions of myself fully formed, but different, their eyes hollow, always reaching out to me, wanting to take my place. In another, the two of them held me down, strapped me to a table, and started cutting off my arms and legs. That's when I awoke with a scream, ah! <gasps> nearly fired off the gun, gripped tightly in my hand. Half a chest sat on the table, the organs inside visible, growing while the foot had managed to add a full leg to it, the beginnings of its genitals taking shape. My dream so recent, face drenched in sweat, I nearly brought up the weapon and fired. I wouldn't say curiosity made me stay my hand. Just as much as they scared me, I found an odd attachment to them forming, understanding that these things had come from me, and they might be able to provide me with some kind of answer to what was happening I doubt I managed a full two hours of sleep that night. Up above me, I heard a door opening around eight in the morning. The chest had finished, a stubby arm protruding from it, along with a neck. I'd moved the other body onto the floor an hour or so earlier, two legs complete, its own chest taking shape. Rudy? Laura called out. I'd never heard her voice waver so much. She recoiled when she saw me step into the living room. I certainly looked a fright with my stubble and dead eyes. They're still here, aren't they? Of course they are. What did you expect? She hesitantly approached the door. I want to see them. Why? I thought you left for good, to be honest. Her eyes drifted away from me. I almost did. God, this is just... It's too much for us. 
We need to talk to someone to find out what's going on. So they can cut me up? See what makes me tick? I'm not going to let it happen. Just let me see them. I stepped aside and then followed her down. Her walk slowed the closer she got. Her own face tired, I noticed, perhaps plagued by nightmares of her own. I can see them growing, she whispered, right hand clasped across her mouth. Only a few more hours, I think. Process seems to be getting faster by the minute, equal with both of them. Whole thing must have been dormant before or something. I don't know, but maybe they do. She turned towards me, horrified. You're going to let them finish? This is an abomination. You need to get rid of them. What? Kill them? Bury them? Or maybe cremate them? Won't change anything, and you know it. I still made them, and I could still make more. I want to know why. Talk to someone who can help. Maybe this isn't... Maybe someone knows about other people like you. We have to at least try. I am trying. I found my voice picking up, my hand growing tighter on the gun, the wet sound of the bodies getting louder. I'm going to ask them when they're complete and see what they have to say. She took a step closer, scowling, certainly no longer viewing me as the man she married. Or maybe I was wrong, and maybe the reason she came back and fought so much was because she did still love me. If they do have a mind of their own, she said to me, and they do know things you don't, have you asked yourself what else they may know and what else they may want to do? They'll have that knowledge for a reason, and whatever power is at work here, do you really think it's good? I could see them in my dream, chaining me down, bringing out the knives, but I refused to believe it. I think in the end I, I didn't want to believe these things were malevolent, because they'd come from my own flesh. And what would it say about me? I guess we'll find out then when they wake up. She turned from me and towards them. She walked up to the first one, to the bald head still taking shape, clearly wearing my face. I caught a glimpse of the hollow sockets where eyes hadn't had a chance to form yet, shivered at the sight, and felt glad Laura didn't see me. I never expected to see Laura with a gun in her hand, too surprised to even move before the first two shots nearly detonated my duplicate's head. I reached for her by instinct only, but not in time to stop the next shots cutting into the chest of the other, through where a newly formed heart had yet to start beating. The barrel of my weapon cut across her face, drew blood and a large <laughs> bruise before sending her to the floor. She ignored my attack and fired at her, both of them crying as she did. I fell on top of her in a poor attempt to stop her, but by the time I could wrestle the gun from her, all it could emit was a hollow click. The chamber empty. What did you do? I whispered to her, aware of the silence in the basement. I stood and approached the dead flesh. Nothing grew anymore. The skin seemed to deflate in on itself, rot faster than it should. They'd never tell me anything. Behind me, I heard Laura stand. I'm sorry, Rudy. I'm going to go call the police. We can't go back. I felt nothing when I turned to watch her go, the moment having robbed me of emotions, of any sense of self-control. Even without her phone call, I could hear the sirens picking up, probably from her gunshots, and she mounted the steps and vanished, our life together ruined beyond repair. I grabbed a knife from my work table. Outside, I heard two cars pull to a halt. A storm window in the basement let me see the flashing lights and the officers walking up to our driveway. At the sound of the first round of knocking, I took up a seat beside my work table. The pain didn't bother me as much as I thought it would as I cut through the base of my pinky finger. Before it even struck the floor, I could see the changes beginning, faster than before. A new hand pouring from the severed finger almost instantly. My ring finger landed on the floor next to the growing form, and then my other pinky... Mr. Mary? By the time I heard the officers shouting my name, I'd started on my toes. The thick, sinewy sound of flesh rapidly coming into existence, blocking out the creak of their boots coming down.
down the stairs. Author's Note The story originally came about from a brainstorming session for vampire stories. I thought of the idea that a vampire had grown so powerful his body began splitting up into separate beings, and I first visualized this as one of his fingers being cut off and growing into another version of him. At some point, the vampire angle was dropped and the main character became an average guy. The story flowed pretty smoothly from there, though in my first draft, he beat his wife to death at the end of the story after she shot his doubles, but I thought it seemed too out of character, so I ended up removing it. Welcome back, folks. Hope you enjoyed the story. This is a story to kiss with. Oh my goodness. <laughs> All right, so who was in this story, Rish Outfield? Can you tell me a little bit about the narrator, for example? Shoot, I don't know. Oh, I, I was the narrator. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, Rudy was played by Rish Outfield. That's right. Rudy slash narrator, who is the same person. You are. And Lara was played by Veronica Jaguer. And yes, the story was, as we said before, produced by Brian Lincoln. He of the Parsec Award-winning podcast, Fullcast Full cast Podcast. Didn't he also win a uh, Parsec for HG World as well? Does he get to keep that? I, I know that's kind of a collaborative thing, and I, but I think he and Scott Pig, who also produces for us, are producers over there, and they uh, got to go up to the podium and accept the award, at least for that bunch. Wow, that's really cool. Let's see if we can get Scott Pig to produce an episode for us. We should. I, I'm going to see if I can get him to do next week's. Wow. Do you want to call him right now? Or yeah, just wait uh, until hold on a sec. Uh, keep, keep everybody uh, occupied while I take care of that. So it's October. We try to have scary stories in October because it's the greatest month. And uh, this is a pretty scary story. Um, Brian has this podcast where he explains how to do certain effects, explains tricks and tips in how to save the princess, how to do full cast audio productions, you know, get all the voices to sound like they're in the same room or two voices that are in the same room, like Big and Me, to sound like they're not in the same room. All, all sorts of fun things like that. Usually when he does an episode for us, he'll do a making of special, uh, like they used to show on television back when there was television. Uh, but this week he's not going to because he said it was really straightforward. I, for one, though, would like to know what made that sound. <laughs> uh, you yeah. know what sound I'm talking about. I do. Uh, I, I I made a sound like that once. On the toilet. Yes. yes. I, I wish you had lit a match. <laughs> no, yeah. I used a sound like that way back like 50 episodes or so ago. I, it was the story Verses on St. Andrews by Barry and Henderson. There was the part where the witch ensorcels the vines around her house and they suddenly start reaching out and they grab the bully and they pick him up off of the ground and uh, I use that sound when the vines start reaching out. It's all <laughs> when they reached out. You, you used that same sound as in this episode. Yeah, pretty much the same. Uh, you stole it or you created it? I stole Well, I didn't steal it. I got it legally and lawfully, but didn't create it myself. But what it was, was a pot of spaghetti being stirred around with a spoon that made that <laughs> kind of a sound that you get. I don't know if that's what Ryan did in this particular case. He probably used a pot of macaroni, which is totally different. But, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. But uh, maybe he'll let us know in the comments, or maybe he'll just flip us the bird and move on. We would have it coming. That yeah, that's what I would do. Do you remember a long time ago, probably around the time Versus on St. Andrews dropped, there was a listener who said that he couldn't stand a certain sound. And I, I can't remember what the sound was, but it was something innocuous. It was something you're just like, really? I'm pretty sure it was water being poured into a glass. And that was the sound that just sent his nerves, the hairs on the back of his neck standing up and his shoulders are twitching. And <laughs> Do you think that person has maybe taken their life by now? Mayhaps. That's too bad. But if, if by any chance that person was still listening... What reaction would they have to the sounds of the body parts regenerating? <laughs> it, it was an upsetting sound, right? It was, yes. Okay. Very much so. 
which added to, you know, it just made that story all the creepier. I mean, it's a really creepy idea to begin with, this idea of you accidentally cut your finger off and then all of a sudden it's growing a person from the other end of it. That's a pretty creepy idea. Another creepy idea, you accidentally cut your finger off in the basement and then you look for a second and you just like, ah, eh, it's gone. <laughs> you don't tear apart the basement looking for that finger. That's creepy to me. <laughs> I think a part of him wanted to grow that other body. Maybe. Well, I mean, obviously, at, by the end. Right. I'm seeing that fly again. But we're not going to have any outtakes this week. We're going to leave it all in. <laughs> in this story, there was something about it. The reason I liked it so much was just the atmosphere, the just general creepiness about that story. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that sound disturbing you? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great mood piece um, that I just really enjoyed it. And I, I chose it almost completely based on that it just really got under my skin and creeped me out and i just thought this one will be great for october we never find out exactly why this is happening why it happens to rudy and not everybody else and what the plan is when these things fully emerge Mm -hmm. for lack of a better word do you like stories where those questions aren't answered or do you like a bow at the end uh, you remember the end of Psycho, where they spend like four minutes, where it's like, right. Norman's mother died, and his psychosis was, and they explain the whole thing? I think it's because, you know, in those days, all those theories were a lot more new to people, you know, psychosis and multiple personalities and split personalities and so forth were not something that everybody learned about in high school for 20 years or more. Didn't you read Lord... Oh, never mind. Go on. So, yeah, you know, I think they had to do that, so I can't really fault them for it. But sometimes it it just depends, I think, on the story. In this particular case, I was fine with not knowing. You know, it was kind of a desperate act that he does at the end where he's just cutting off fingers. He's getting himself some reinforcements to take on the police and his wife with. Yeah, you know, who knows what's going to happen from there. Are they going to turn on him and kill him? We don't really know. That's kind of like the creepiness still of the story. It leaves you coming up with something yourself. Oh, she's what what is going to happen? Uh, They'll probably kill the cops. And then once they got all that taken care of, what happens? Do they turn around and turn on him? Or does he lead a band of merry clones out into the woods and they rob from the rich and give to the poor or whatever? You know, I don't know. But I like sometimes for that to be the case. Um, I like there to be an open-ended ending sometimes, you know. The bad guy's heading down the hill, and now we know that it's hit the fan, and something's going to happen, but we don't know what. It's just left. You just know something bad is coming, or something good is coming, or whatever the open-ended thing is. There's a place for it, you know. There's a place for us. Another Hitchcock film where he does the opposite is The Birds. Have you ever seen The Birds? Where just one day they turn against us. All the birds decide that we're their enemies and they flock together, pun not intended, to kill us. And at the end, this family has, you know, escaped another bird attack and they all get in the car and roll up their windows or whatever and start to drive. And there's just thousands of birds and they're everywhere. And then the credits roll. And as a kid... I was furious about that. I was like, but why? Why were they doing that? And and does the family get away? Are they okay? You know, do what? What? Why? But as I've gotten older, I've come to admire kind of the balls Enos. Sorry, we don't need the explicit warning this week of that ending of just saying, who knows why? And who knows what happened to this family? There's something brave about that because we, especially, you know, our the Western audience, I guess, have come to depend on everything being explained and all the questions answered. And, and, you know, that show Lost was on for five or six years. And there were some people that just couldn't take it. It's like, I want to know what the answers are. And I think those were the people that gave up on the show or when the show finally ended, were just like, oh, what a waste of time. But there were others that were just like the journey, this, this constant deluge of questions 
some of which will never be answered is totally cool. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I guess I'm not, I'm saying that you could have it one way and you can have it the other. And then some people will be satisfied. Some people will be unsatisfied and vice versa. If you, right. if you had explained. Right. Yeah. It's always going to be, uh, good for some and not good for others there's going to be one person who comments and says oh i love that ending it just leaves you wondering and makes you oh i just love it and then the other person going oh what the hell it just ended right as it's about to start or whatever you know you never know what uh, uh there's always the two sides and, and you can't please everybody it's just plain impossible because everybody's different and so everybody likes things different. So, you know, you just do your best. The good thing is there's all different kinds of stories out there. And uh, this one is just another different kind. I really uh, I really liked uh, that uh, open ending where you just, it gives you that creepiness to go on out with. And then you can go out and enjoy the nice uh, October fall colors and the orange and the black everywhere. The pumpkins on everybody's doorstep, you know. Yeah, and, and, you know, there are different kinds of horror stories, too. I mean, in this one, geez, it, it, it's kind of hard to put your finger on what's scary about it. I, I guess the unknown, but also just the the why, what, what, what is the, what do they want kind of thing, you know? I mean, it, it's possible that these were, uh, well, I, I'm not even going to speculate as to what was going on. Because we know from the author's note that it originally started as a vampire story. And so I guess you can say that that's what was going on. But but he never tells us. And that has to be intentional, right? Yeah, I think so. I think that's one thing that happens a lot in horror, especially. A lot of the horror is you don't know. Things have gone bad. Like the birds. The birds all suddenly turned on humans. Why? Nobody knows. You never know. You can't know. How are you going to find out what made a bird decide to attack people you can interview it you know a bird can't explain itself so there's no way of knowing it's horrible and it's scary and there's n and that i think is is what makes it all the more scary is just the fact that you don't know and you can't know what is going on and that happens tons of times you know you just have a masked killer that is just going around killing people and you don't know why he's killing people and what is he doing this for and that's what makes it all the more scary if they went through and did all the backstory. Had, had Rob Zombie make a, a, a movie that explained why he was that way. And all And that, that he was stuff. once a little boy and he was picked on. He was bullied and he became that way not because he was bad. Right. That exact thing. Suddenly it's not scary anymore. You know, it's like we talked about uh, way back in episode 22. I don't think we even numbered episodes in those days, so we'll never know. <laughs> You're probably right. I'm just guessing. Uh, but way back in those days, we talked a lot about the Cylons mm. on Battlestar Galactica and how scary they were to begin with because they just... Why? The blue. Why do they do this? What do they want? Yeah, they just destroyed all of humanity. They destroyed all the 12 colonies, you know. They did just out of the blue, sudden attack. They killed everybody. Nobody knows why. You don't know anything about them. But then as the seasons go on, they delve more and more and more into them. And then pretty soon they're just characters. They're not scary. They're just other characters. And uh, we never saw the end of it ourselves. We didn't ever get that final season to find out exactly what happened but i wouldn't doubt if they were all sitting around a fire freaking playing kumbaya together in the last episode because they'd taken all the sinisterness away from the cylons and made them not scary i mean gosh you remember i think the first episode that they had was that one called 33 where it just best episode of the series it was amazing dude. every 33 minutes they just appear and they had no idea why and what was going on and oh it was so it was like, what are we doing wrong yeah the suspense was so freaking amazing and so thick in that because the cylons were just so unknowable at that time and and, and then all, eventually a human and a Cylon have a kid together. And right. We find out that some of the most human characters are actually Cylons. Yeah, all the characters in the whole friggin' show are Cylons, it turns out. They introduce Cousin Oliver because all the kids have gotten too ugly. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, that's one of those things that can happen. You know, you, you if you tell people how everything is and what it's all about, then it stops being as scary as it used to be. That's uh, one of those things that you sometimes have to do in horror. Well, that may be one of the reasons that people like H.P. Lovecraft. 
he would always have, you know, it's like it was too horrible to describe. Words could not explain what he had seen inside that gaping maw, you know, and full of stuff like that, of, of things that were so beyond our ken that to look on them was to welcome madness. And, you know, I guess that that works for people. I, I, I just, uh, I've never really been a, a Lovecraft fan, but I know there are people that just eat that up. You know, it's just mm-hmm. like, ooh, what? Because, and you've heard it said countless times by horror writers or by any writers, that whatever you can imagine is infinitely scarier than whatever we can create with a special effect or a matte painting or a puppet or CG or with words. Mm-hmm. You know, just leaving it to your imagination to fill in whatever scares you, whatever you think that might be. Ugh. I don't know. It sort of goes hand in hand with the you can't please everybody depicting something that, that has been withheld for a long, long time. When you finally see it, I, there, there are many examples of that. But uh, maybe maybe we could talk about that for a minute about not being able to please everybody all the time. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? As far as you can please some of the people all of the time, but never please all of the people some of the time. I don't think that's quite the uh, way the phrase goes. Uh, 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 well, okay, you tap dance here while I go attack announcer man. I said magic spider. Woo! Super Robot Monkey Team! Yeah, I don't know. It's it's the way it is. I mean, you can't please everybody. It sounds like you actually have something to say on this, so I'm going to hand the baton to you, and you can run with it, and then maybe I'll have know where you're going and be able to uh, chime in. Right. We have a podcast, uh-huh. and every couple weeks we put out an episode, and it's it's my hope... That everybody loves every single episode from beginning to end, including the outtakes. Um, But that doesn't happen. And it increasingly frustrates, irritates, vexes me that there are people that don't like what we've done. And I'll be like, oh, and, you know, I get angry or I get defensive or I get self-critical or I, you know, I get depressed. But I've been told time and time again by people like Brian, for instance, sent me an email and he said, you know, I uh, because recently somebody said something about the show and I took it really badly, as I am wont to do. <laughs> and I have to admit, I didn't take the high road and say, you have a point. You know what I mean? I, I, I railed against this person. I was very angry. I, I used words that maybe I shouldn't have. But then afterward, I thought about it and I thought, maybe maybe the guy has a point. I mean, obviously, we're not... A professional paying show. I mean, this is not our job. This is something we do in our free time or, you know, three o'clock in the morning before you have to go to work. And gosh, even if it were our job, we couldn't please everybody all the time or we couldn't make perfect art every episode. And I, I, I think we've talked about this a lot on the show where I'll hear an episode or I'll hear a a, a line reading or whatever, and I just, oh, if only I could have had one more take, or, oh, I didn't like the way I did that, or I don't like that sound effect, or did you hear that? There was kind of a tin on that voice. It's, oh, you know, I I tear it apart in my mind. But we can't have one episode come out every six months. We have to have a middle ground and... The situation I created by getting really angry at this guy was probably not the most positive situation because obviously the listener had listened to the show and listened to more than one episode of the show to rub my nose in something I had said three episodes before and, you know, cared enough to say, hey, this is my opinion. These are my thoughts. I take exception with what you said, which in turn I took exception with. And so, you know, I should have I should have taken it in that spirit and said, okay, you know, this is somebody that listens to the show trying to tell me, well, that I'm wrong, but also hoping that maybe I can make the show better. Anyhow, so, so I, I, I've been thinking about it and I thought, okay, well, we've got a show. Maybe we can talk about this for a minute Mm -hmm. or 20. (laughs) The whole idea of art is creating something and trying to put a message out there or put a, a feeling out there or put a you know, create something that will entertain or frighten or confuse 
or science, titillate, science, uh, or, or, or whatever it might be. Action. But it's not going to affect everybody in the same way. And we've all read a story where you're super excited about it. You're just like, holy cow, this story changed my world. And you share it with somebody like your wife or your roommate or your best friend or, or your mom or whatever it is. And they don't get the same thing out of it. Right. And many times I'll, ooh, I just, I get angry because they miss to the point. Mm-hmm. And all that, but that's, you know, that's how art is. And I remember the guy, uh, your buddy. Dean Wesley Smith. Dean Wesley Smith said, if half of the people that read your story hate it and the other half love it, you've done something right. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine if half the people hated something that I wrote. I, I would... Well, I would kill myself. I would kill myself if three people hated it. You know me. But that, that's what he says is, you know, you want somebody to respond strongly to it, even if it's in a negative way. You want that visceral reaction. You want people to be moved enough to care about it so that they will respond. And if they just go, eh, right. then you failed. So, you know, especially in October where we've got scary stories – you know, not everybody is going to find uh, this story or next week's story or whatever scary. People are afraid of different things. And, you know, we've had conversations with people about all oh, the scariest movie I ever saw was. And they're like, that wasn't scary. That was stupid. You know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so I will be silent for a moment and allow you to contribute to the show. <laughs> You can't stop midpoint like where, that where was and expect me to pick it up. Uh, all right. So let me backtrack a second. The statement was that we had said in too many episodes that these are finished products, that there's no point in saying I didn't like the sound quality of this or I didn't like the way you pronounced this or I didn't like the voice that you got to do this or I didn't like the editing. I didn't like the pace. I didn't like the music. I didn't like to use the same sound effect four times, etc. because it was done. We weren't going to go back and revise and re-record that one line because somebody didn't like the way that line was. And the listener said, well, that's laziness. That's saying that. And I'm paraphrasing. My interpretation of what the listener said was that you're, you're saying, oh, okay, well, it's perfect. It's good. It's, there's no point. There's nothing I can learn from you pointing out something that you didn't like about the story. And the more I thought about that, the more I agreed. You know, somebody saying, hey, there was reverb on this one voice and there wasn't on the others. Okay, we're not going to go back and fix that in that episode because it was a month ago. But the next time we're like, okay, let's make sure we don't have reverb on that one voice or use the same sound effect again and again and again. I was like, okay, well, we'll keep that in mind. Maybe we'll make the sound effect ourselves this time so we have something that we can switch out. I think the point, the positive point that was trying to be made was every episode can teach you to make the next episode better. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case. And you talk about my buddy. My buddy, my buddy, sing along. Whatever I go, he goes. Come on, my buddy. You know the words, my buddy. <laughs> Didn't we see that on a, a a thing where it said ten toys that made you gay? <laughs> yes. That was one of them. It may have been number one on the list. No, no number oh. one was the giant phallic spooge shooting uh, <laughs> right. squirt gun. The uh, oozinator, I think it was called. And it shot spooge <laughs> out. And all the kids were like, oh, here, right in my mouth. <laughs> oh, my uh, Lord. S- I, I, I can't think of even air that. I, I just. I the, have no idea. The delight with which these. <laughs> All right. Oh, interesting. I'm sorry. That's off topic. Maybe I'll have to put a a, a link to that uh, particular thing on, in the links. So in the try show to, notes. Yes, in the show notes. I'll try and remember that. Uh, anyway. Science! <laughs> but yeah, my buddy... Dean Wesley Smith. That's right. All right. You, you took my cue this time instead of singing that damn song again. <laughs> yes, he... he we, we've talked about this before where he said that. That's what you're supposed to do when you're a writer. You don't go back and rewrite the story again and again and again because you just steadily remove your voice from it until it's as plain and uninteresting as anything else that any committee of 500 people could produce. But instead, what you do is you take the lessons that you learn from that one and you apply them to the next story. And that way, you're instead of fussing over minutiae on your story, you're writing 
a new story, getting that practice and you're becoming better. And, you know, I, what I got from his comment was that he was saying, yeah, we wanted to try and tell you that we like this kind of a story versus that kind of a story. So maybe at your story selection, you can uh, hone that so that you can get the kind of things that your listeners want to hear, which... Well, see, that's problematic. Goes back, yeah, it goes back to what we were talking about before. You can't please everybody all the time. There's no way to do so. If you are going to say, oh, okay, well, this listener doesn't like this, so we're going to model what we pick after what this listener likes, then the other listener is now going to be like, oh, I don't like the stories you choose anymore. You used to choose good stories. And I felt that way about various podcasts, you know. There have been podcasts where the people who are in charge of Picking the stories have changed. You know, I've noticed. I like in the stories, and then after a while, I'm not liking the stories so much anymore. And I'm not so keen to listen to the podcast anymore. You know, some podcasts have managed to keep my attention still with other things that they do, even though I'm not so into the stories, and the stories are only ones that I like every 10th episode or something. And others have just... I give up on i just can't listen to this show anymore because there's i'm just wasting my time i'm not getting any enjoyment out of it and why would i keep listening if i'm not when it comes down to it and we talked about it uh, last week i think where we said you know our criteria for picking stories is that the story's fun that it's a, a good story we don't really have a set criteria it's like they say sometimes you know an editor doesn't know what he wants to buy until he gets it in his hand reads it and then goes wow that's what i want to buy you don't know what you're going to like and what you're not going to like some people can you know nicole i'm sure feels that way a lot of times where she's getting the stories that people have sent in and she says okay i think they're going to take this one and this one oh i'm pretty sure big's totally not going to get this one he never gets comedy stories and then that's one that i actually want and keep and i tell her to accept it and she's like ah oh, i can't believe it i was sure that you wouldn't want this one i remember there's been a couple where she said i don't know why people liked this story so much but they did i'll forward it on to you <laughs> you know it's like something that she didn't respond to but the oompas really dug it right and yeah there, there have been many i mean it's just you and i alone there have been stories that you liked a lot more than I did or, or, or the opposite of that. And it's, it's we're sort of the final say. And, you know, if, if you are really excited about a story and I'm not, sometimes I'll be like, nee, which you hear a lot from me. And then other times I'll be, OK, love, we'll we'll do that and see if maybe I can get excited about it after the production's been done or if the listeners will feel the way that you did. Right. I think the real key, and the one thing that I finally took as my motto, uh, basically, as I'm picking stories, is, is it a story I like enough that I would spend the hours and hours and hours and hours that it takes to produce an episode of it? Am I going to want to do that? Or am I going to be like, oh, got to edit that stupid episode. Got to get it done. Is it going to be tedious to me? Is it going to be something I don't want to do anymore? Because... If that's the case, I'm not going to keep doing the show for much longer. I'm just going to be like, screw that. I'm done with this show. We did that final episode already, right? Let's, let's, let's put it on. You can only do so much. It's, it's a hobby, what we have here. And you do hobbies because you like them and they're fun. You don't do hobbies because, I don't know, because you need an extra job that doesn't pay you. <laughs> that's something that I, I think I was in college when I first heard somebody say this and i think it was a screenwriting teacher my very first screenwriting class which you and i had together i think that's where i met you yeah and he said don't try and write something that will sell oh try and figure out what is popular right now what are people buying what are people making movies vampire or, love stories exactly and, and yeah ex the, the vampire love story thing comes to mind immediately because i have a friend that was like this is what's popular right now. I'm going to try and write a and fill in the blank vampire love story. A story about a wizard and a wizard school. And what he said was write what you would want to read or what you would want to see. Something that captivates you. Something that energizes you because you're the one that's going to have to put in all of this work and the hours and hours and hours of writing and rewriting and you know just time of that 
work. And if you're writing toward a mythical dollar sign or sale or whatever, you're going to run out of gas a lot faster than if you're writing something that came from within you that you just got to get out or it's trying to say something that you want to say. I wish I'd learned that in that class because I swear I didn't want to write anything that I wrote in that class. And that was perhaps the worst experience I'd ever had writing was in that screenwriting class. I never wrote a single story that I liked, that I was proud of, or anything. It was just assignment. I had to do it to get a grade, and I did it. And I would write the kind of crap that film students would think was cool, which is gah, not something that you want to hear, read, or see. <laughs> it wasn't until after I graduated from, from college that I finally realized, hey, I'm, I, I've got ideas that I enjoy that I would like to write and I actually spent some time writing on some of those things and I enjoyed writing for a while and I was just like wow why did I do all this stuff with film because I went nowhere with that but that's something I I, I don't know that we've ever talked about it on the show but since we started the podcast, I always wanted to talk about my creative writing class at school. And I, I know I have talked about it, but I wanted to just go into it and talk about the lessons I learned. Because I learned so much from that class, but it was mostly learning what not to do. Mm -hmm. And the teacher had this really strict idea of what worked in a story and a, a, you know, a, a formula to creating a good story, uh, art, and, 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 and something that would be captivating and, and uh, idiosyncratic and, and all this. And, and, and he would hammer it into us that, you know, you have to do this. You know, it's kind of like if you've ever heard a screenwriting teacher talk about you need a car chase on page seven or whatever. And I've always railed against that because I took that creative writing class before I ever tried my hand at screenwriting. But this guy, it was an advanced writing class. It wasn't just, you know whatever 101. the 101 class was. And so I was in this class with a bunch of other people that wrote for fun or wrote, wanted to write for a living or, or, or you know, they, they considered themselves to be writers. Mm -hmm. So the competition was really strong in the class. You know, it, it was one of those where you wanted to please this teacher because he seemed to know what he was talking about and he was so opinionated and, and we've all been in classes like that where you're just like, gosh, if, if there was something I could do to, so that he would notice me, so that he would think I was smart or good. And, and, and you know, that's something about school and about college and all that is you, you, you haven't quite found yourself and you want acceptance. And of course, I still want acceptance, but I wanted this teacher to You'll say. You'll never get it. <laughs> never. <laughs> I wanted him to notice me and say, oh, this guy is one of the best writers in the class. This guy is the best writer in this class. I am going to pair this guy up with my daughter. <laughs> and I couldn't please him. I couldn't. He, he would give out a writing assignment and say it has to be like this. And I'd be like, okay, every tendon inside me says don't do what he says but i'm going to because he knows what he's talking about he's a professor and i'm nothing and i'm, I'm gonna write this and every paper every story that i would hand in he would tear apart he would give really low scores to and he would say you know this comes out of nowhere and i'm like you told us for it to come out of nowhere this was the the guy other than stephen king who just hammered it into your head that, that you can't have a plan you can't have an outline you can't know where you're going otherwise you hamper your creativity you put a straight jacket on your inner uh Tobias Bakel. I, I, I don't know what the 90s equivalent to Tobias Bakel was. And so I would try, try, and I couldn't do it. I think the best I ever got was like a C plus on one of these papers. And I was like, I'm not going to get a good grade in this class. And yet I'm working harder in this, you know, and really, really trying. And finally, he gave us this assignment and it had to be A, B, C, and D. And I was just sick of it sick of bending over backwards and getting a crappy grade. So I was just like, you know, I always wanted to write a story about Bigfoot or what, you know, I always wanted to write a story about a man with two butts. And so I wrote the story that I wanted to write and just tried to make the best story I could and get onto paper all of the thoughts and questions that I had had. And it was the only story I got an A on. I couldn't believe it. And he, I, I remember he wrote, now this is more like it at the top. And I was just like, you bastard. <laughs> the only story you liked was the one that I wrote breaking all of your rules. And it, here it is a decade later. And it occurred to me that maybe he wanted us 
to discover our own voice and try to break out of no no the guy was such a pompous <laughs> ass it's interesting I, because last week we were talking about our film professor who was the same kind of a guy he would but he would attack the sacred cows all the time yes he would attack things that people held de- to, near and to dear. freak all of us film students out and we're all like but but star, star wars, wars is, is the reason is I'm great here. and I th- and we talked about it, you know, at the time we were just stupid college kids and we didn't understand what he was challenging. But yeah, now now that we're older, we see that he was just trying to get us to stand up for whatever it is that we love. To and take the other side like, of the yeah, argument. In one class he's like, what is your favorite movie? And he's like, my favorite movie? Raiders of the Lost Ark. And he's like, ah, Raiders of the Lost Ark is gay. <laughs> and then there was just silence. And it wasn't until I finally was like, hey, you know what? That movie opened up my eyes to what films could be, to a larger world. It's like from that point on, I wanted to be something that I didn't want to be before. It's like that is the reason I'm in this class and all that. And he's like, oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Funny you haven't said much in this class before. And I was just like, whoa, what are you talking about? (laughs) I've been seething with anger every time you belittle something that somebody just said, I love the little mermaid. And and he was just like, oh, yeah? Well, you know what that teaches? That teaches that you need to uh, tie yourself to a man and give up all of your hopes and dreams. Makes you a housewife. That's what you deserve. And all that. And she'd be crying and stuff. And I'd be like, you bastard. How dare you say that to that? That girl's pretty. And, but she would say nothing. And he was just prodding and picking and sticking and, 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 and nudging until somebody finally snapped. And that's what he wanted. He wanted us to think for ourselves and say, you know what? I'm going to stand up for what I believe despite this man who's the professor telling me that I'm wrong. And, and he respected that. Yeah, it's funny to see that because you've spoken several times about that creative writing professor. Oh, I hated him and, so uh, much. How much you hated him. And now all of a sudden, is this the first time? I, I'm guessing this probably isn't the first time that you've come to the conclusion that maybe he was messing with you until you finally just said, screw you. This is... No, I've never considered that before this moment. <laughs> In fact, I still... I mean, there's the hours and hours that he would say, you know, I've been writing, I've been alive a lot longer than you have. And this is what you have to do. He would do that. He would mention the pap that people are writing all the time. And it's like, and it's all like everything else. And it has nothing to say. And, and, I'll, and maybe, it, you know, I'm willing to give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt and say that maybe he wasn't super arrogant and maybe he wasn't holier than now and maybe he was trying to get us to think for ourselves. Whereas with that film professor, I'm 99% sure that he didn't believe a lot of the things that he would say or that he didn't hate some of the movies he would attack. I remember one time going up to him and saying, and this is this can be in the outtakes, but I was like, you know, the, what do you think of the what George Lucas has done to the Star Wars trilogy? You know, and do you think it's okay to rewrite history in that way and to remake things in a PC way, or you know, say this is what I always wanted to, I always intended to do? And what do you think of that? Because I, I honestly wanted to know what his opinion was, because this guy knew a lot, and we all looked up to him. He was a, he was a really smart guy, and he was, and and he. Despite being Canadian, he was somebody that we could all <laughs> want to be like someday. And he said, have you seen those those new Star Wars special editions? And I was like, yeah. Oh, I went to see the new Star Wars twice. And he said, then who cares what I have to say? You've already voted with your dollar. <laughs> and it hurt my feelings. It really bothered me. But... You know, it's just it's one of those things is like I, I've never forgotten. I voted with my dollar. Right. Kind of thing. It's like yeah. I hated 2007 Transformers. And what would it say about me if I paid to see Transformers 2 or Transformers 3? You vote with your dollar. Yep. Whatever uh, makes the most money is what they're going to try and make next. So. It's definitely the case. Yeah, I, I learned that lesson too. That was one of the things that I very uh, I remember very well from that class is the voting with your dollar thing. Or with your loony in his case, I believe. The toonies and the loonies. Right. You he vote would, with your loony. He would always talk about the loony and the toonie and Saskatchewan. I believe uh, he was told that if he ever said Regina, he would be fired. 
Right. But but he could say Regina or Reg <laughs> That's what's called a callback, folks. Back to the, the 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 story at hand. I guess what I learned from that professor, from the writing, creative writing teacher, was just to stick to my guns and to write what I felt like I should. I, I, and I learned a lot in that class because these were all people that were serious. You know, they weren't just there to get a general education requirement or whatever they called right. those. This was an advanced class for people that wanted, that were English majors or writing, ma- you know, was that a writing major? Aiming to write for a living, uh, journalism majors, that kind of stuff. Botany majors like me. And so so being around these guys, I, I was really stimulated and they would share what they had written and, and then we would talk about it. And oftentimes they would tear it apart and stuff. And, and that taught me something too. It's like, don't do that. Don't ever do that. This guy worked hard on this story and to just say, ugh. I mean, that's not even a word. That's your response to the story. Ugh. Don't ever, ever, ever do that. And I know that that's influenced me all these years later as a co-editor of the Doonstief. I always try and find something positive to say, even when I'm rejecting a story, even when I know from the first sentence that I don't want it. It's like, find something, something good to say because, geez, I'm a coward. I'm not going to send my work out like that. But this person did. They sent their work and it's made it through to me. And, you know, not everybody will agree with that. That writing teacher would say, you know, you're coddling a bad writer. You're encouraging more bad writing. You know, he'd say these things, and I think he believed what he was saying, but it's just, that's not me. And, yeah, as far as the show goes, the stories that we choose to produce have to be good stories. They have to be fun, but, you know, they, they I have to respond to it in some way. Or if I don't, you have to respond to it right. in a strong way. And you know what? I'm sorry if in the past, I, you know, I, I remember I said a kick-ass Rish Outfield reading in one episode <laughs> and you laughed and, and said, you left that in? <laughs> and I, I, I don't want to come across as a, that arrogant college professor that said, that my, you know, I know better than you do. And I've been wrong before, you know, and I've made mistakes on the show and no episode has been perfect. See, I don't know. Let's say that the show goes five more years and the TARDIS appears and the doctor says, here, come with us to 2015, sorry, 16, and listen to an episode of the Doonstie from October 2016. Would that episode be better than the episode we're doing right now? You listen to it. Would you be like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to tell Rich not to kill himself. We got something to look forward to. This is awesome. Plus, Avengers 2 was really good. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, it's possible. I wonder if our show will make it so far as that five oh, hell no baby five years from now is such a long time it's more than you know we've done yet I think we're at three and a half years three and a few months okay so the TARDIS comes and it's February two thousand twelve <laughs> it's like the second to last episode yeah, of the Doonstief the fabled Doonstief it the makes me laugh to cool. think about that because uh, there are some podcasts that lend themselves to handing off to somebody else. Steve Ely does his show, and then when he can't deal with it anymore, he hands it over to Mer Lafferty, and then she goes on with it for a while, and at some point she'll hand it over, and it's like a real magazine, you know? They have an editor, and then the editor changes, and they get a different editor and stuff like that, but our show is, is a little different than that. I don't think there could be such a thing as a Dune Steve without us on the, I mean, maybe we could get a different editor, but we'd still, we wouldn't have us on the end of the show. So it probably wouldn't quite be the same. So I can't see it going so long as that. But I guess you never know. Who knows? I mean, what else are we going to do? This is sort of a detour, but uh, recently on Marshall Latham's podcast, he did a story called The Trial of Thomas Jefferson. And if you listen to it, it's almost a Doonstief episode because I read the story and you voice one of the main characters, and Abby voices one of the main characters, and Marshall voices one of the main characters. And the only non Doonstief member is uh, Kay Thompson. Is Dave Thompson over at Podcastle? But you know, you and I sort of know him. And then afterward, Marshall talks about the story. 
the way that you and I talk about the story afterward. You know, it's like from my personal experience, this reminded me of this and that. And it's almost like a Dune Steve episode after we have gone. <laughs> Uh, only, you know, I'm, I'm sure much, much cooler. Yeah. Um, and, and and that podcast, I, I know we've plugged it before, but it's called Journey Into Space. Science. Mystery. Uh, the Journey Into podcast. So, and we'll put a link to the sh- in the show notes. But check that out. It really was up my alley. I mean, the story I responded to, the story is the kind of story that had they submitted it to us, we would have taken it. And then, you know, afterward, he he talked about the story, which I like, and not a lot of shows do. And so uh, when our show goes off the air, uh, maybe the spirit of our show can continue in the Journey Into podcast. There you and, go. And, and in that way, I will never have died. Yay. I'm sorry. And I think I've gotten off track the point that I was trying to make. Um, I, I, I wanted standard. to say – it is. It's, it wouldn't be our show if – we had a script and we followed it. And, and, and you know, so that takes me back. Or if we had a point and we made it. Darn right. <laughs> You're darn trutin', as my friend used to mock me for having once accidentally said. <clears throat> the, the, the reason we're having this conversation is because of that reaction that I had to the comment from the listener. And I hope that, you know, a year from now or, or five years from now or whatever, our show is better. And, you know, we've improved because of experience, because we have made so many episodes and made so many mistakes and learned from them. And, you know, that I guess that's what growing up is or that's what getting older is. It's been interesting to do all these things. I, I mean, we, we try to fix the problems and, and, and correct any errors before they go out. And uh, I'm not going to name names, but... Everybody, if you've listened to a podcast other than ours and Journey Into, has heard an episode where there's a flub or a mess up or an error or, you know, some kind of thing. But it's, it's, it's not been caught. It's not been realized. And it just makes the air. And it's never corrected. And, yeah, that just drives you crazy. I, I, I think it's totally forgivable. But it drives you crazy. No, both of us just, ah, uh, why, how? Do they have no editor kind of thing? Do they have no pride? Um, and again, it sounds like I'm boasting and I, 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 that's not what I mean to say. I just, oh, geez, sorry. But you learn from these mistakes and hopefully the listener doesn't catch the mistakes as much as we do. And, and you know what? Sometimes they will. Sometimes they'll say, you know, you mispronounced so-and-so word and we would never have known. But if ever that word comes up again, I remember the, I remember there was a, a word in Rampy in the Bell Tower that you and I had never heard in our lives our combined 14 years of life yeah. we'd never heard. So we looked it up and we said it or whatever. And like six months later, we heard that word on another podcast mispronounced. But we never would have known had we not had Rampion in the Bell Tower. It's just one of those, you know, we build and build and build. And, 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 and there's a million new ways that we can screw up. But hopefully, 25 old ways that we won't screw up. Screw up. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. He screwed it up. I don't know. Did did I make the point that I set out to make? Was this a complete waste of time, this conversation? Because, yeah, I I did want to talk about the horror of the unknown and the questions that aren't answered and the version of the mist, the story and how much of a problem I had with the mist as a kid and as a teenager and reading it. And then I saw the movie of the mist where they fixed the ending and I was like, ah, they ruined it. I like the way the story ended. When... For 20 years, I hated the way the story ended. <laughs> uh, I wanted to talk about all that stuff, but I, instead I went the other way. Hmm. I don't know. I don't think it was a complete waste of time. I mean, we gave Caroline something to listen to while she jogged. Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. That one goes out to all my peeps, especially you, Caroline Spurry. Wait, what? What Announcer man, what? Wait, okay. Yeah, you know I love you the most. All right, explain that to me after we're no longer recording. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I think uh, we're trying our best, and uh, we'll continue to try to improve. If you have constructive criticism for us, please send it our way. But be be sure to make sure it's constructive, because uh, we do want to improve. We do want to get better. If it's something that we can possibly do, we will try to do it. But, yeah, it's always uh, important to make sure it's 
couched in such a way as that we can handle it as being something other than just being, oh, you stupid, you spilled the milk all over the floor, damn you, you stupid little kid, you know. Because we've had enough of those moments in our lives that we react to it easily uh, in that direction. So, yeah, you know, we're, we're, tr- we're trying and uh, we'd like to uh, make stuff that you like. So hopefully we can do that and uh, we'll continue to uh, do our best. And if you'd like to help out in making things great, volunteer. There's lots of ways that you can do it and we're happy to take any help that we can get. Yes, like Brian helped us this week and many Many weeks. You, you go over there to Full Cast Podcast. The Parsec winning Full Cast Podcast. Thank you. Oh, I believe it's like doctor now. You have to say that before. Yeah. One. But he has interesting things to say every week. And a lot of times he has nice things to say about us. He's a good guy. And he produced this episode for no pay and no accolades. Uh, except for maybe, you know. Except for Parsec winning. That is an accolade, isn't it? Winning! Stop it! And, you know, if you didn't like today's episode, we've got another one coming, and hopefully you'll like that one. And and we are able to keep bringing you these episodes because of producers. Because of viewers like you. Right. Please give. (laughs) You get this shitty tote bag with a Dalek on it. Sorry, I I, know. Too many Doctor Who references today. I apologize. What are we, the Hugos? And Star Wars? Really? Um, no, it was, it's, it's totally different. I don't know, I'm just an announcer. Okay. But, but a good one. Uh, That's what she said. All right, we've been going for a long time. I'm all spent. I feel like I've given birth. <laughs> oh, See look I, at that. See See it's, it's called a, uh, it's called a callback, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Philip Roberts, for today's episode. Yeah, thanks a lot, Phil, for uh, the story. And send us another one. We'd like to be creeped out again. Anyways, uh, hope you enjoyed the show, folks. And please, come back again next week. I'm Big Anklevich. I'm the late Rish Outfield. Good night. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. Scarecrow, I think I'll miss you most of all. Take two. Buh. T. Buh. But, but. <laughs> I'll do the girl for you just to help you. Uh... You always do the girl for me. It's not fair. Sometimes just once I'd like to get to do the girl. <clears throat> we want her to come back for more though. See, but if you leave a girl unsatisfied. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> she finds someone who can satisfy her. Uh, look what you, you always bring the story back to you. Weeks went by of adjustments to life with only nine fingers. Reminds me of a little song. Frodo of, of the, the nine, nine fingers, fingers and the ring of doom. You know what? This is going to be Brian editing it, so he'll appreciate when I say, Win the battle, lose the, the war. war. <laughs> you know, Brian, where there's a whip. There's a way. That's right. (laughs) I could almost feel the cold operating table beneath me, the bright lights blinding me, sharp knives hovering above my nude body, big triangular cuts carved out of my buttocks. The notion didn't seem so far-fetched. Ran out of breath. I was sort of hoping we'd do that for like 10 minutes. (laughs) He's like, will they stop doing this, please? (laughs) Outside, I heard two cars. Outside, I heard two cars pull to a heart. Fuck. Outside, I heard two calls. (laughs) Cut something else off. Her eyes held me. 
cut off what? I don't know. Something. <laughs> you know, that one small thing that you have. <laughs> this is a different character. This isn't me. <laughs> oh. She fall. <clears throat> sadly, the first thing that I thought of was I cut something else off. And then it goes. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Oh, that right. shouldn't make me laugh that much. <laughs> a little voice made me pause. Would you do the little voice? Pause. Littler. Pause. No, no, no. Higher pitch. Pause. There you go. This did come from me after... Oh, never mind. Brian, just to ignore the little, the little voice. That tells you not to kill. <laughs> the foot had managed to add a full leg to it, the beginnings of its genitals taking shape, already bigger than Big Anglovich's. <laughs> and yet they were the small thing they were going to cut off. I didn't say a thing to Laura when I slipped into the bed. Can you be Laura, please? Wonder... Whatever did happen to that finger? Well, that was a weird way of phrasing it, honey. Wonder whatever did happen to that finger. Well, that's still weird, honey. Yeah, well, that's you're not what's entirely written. awake, are you? Mm. Well, let me take advantage of you not being entirely <laughs> awake. Staring at the lump of flesh <clears throat> that I called my wife. Sorry. I'm sorry. Did I say that out loud? I'm meant my daughter <clears throat> okay you've never had this happen before have you like maybe you picked a booger and then a nose grew around it just once okay when i was 13 it also happened but it wasn't a booger <clears throat> bum, 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 bum. i will kill you <clears throat> there's no excuse for that crap hey Scooby. <laughs> a creepy little tale called Giving Birth by Asshat Magic Spider. Asshat Magic Spider. Can you? It's stuck. <laughs> Where can I touch it without turning off the... Damn you! Pulls the string. Just around the river bend. What are you up to? I went to the Disney store today and they were playing I just can't wait to be king. And I was like, wow, I genuinely hate this song. <laughs> I was thinking of Gladiator when he's like, Simba is not a moral man. He must not become king. The Serengeti will become a republic again. Philip Roberts. Yes. Did Stink. we say Philip Roberts at all? I don't know. I think I said by asshat magic spider. Yeah, I was just, I wasn't going to say Philip Roberts until I was sure he used Philip Roberts as his name and not like Philip K. Roberts or Philip McCracken or whatever. Uh, Rudy was played by Rish Outfield. That's right. Rudy slash narrator, who is the same person. You are. And Laura was played by Veronica Gig. Jigger, I think, is what we've uh, finally discovered. Veronica Jigari. I think just Jigger. Veronica Jigger. <laughs> okay, you're getting there. Veronica Jigger. Oh, no, I think it's actually Jigari. <laughs> so I, I need <laughs> it to generate the 1.21 Jigari. Jigarawatts. Of electricity I need. That's right. No, yeah, I used a sound like that way back, like, 50 episodes or so ago. I think the, I want to say, all on St. Mark's, no, that wasn't it. Something like that. A street. What was the name of the street where the witch was, and the character's name was Feeling? Feeling. <laughs> Nothing more than I'm gonna feeling. Look it up While you look it up, I'll do this. Now. Something in my head. Forcing me to listen to your singing must be some kind of OSHA violation, you know? Uh, that reference went way over my head, announcer man. Must be something from the Great Depression, like... No, it's just something that people who have had jobs before in their lives would understand, but... Oh, yeah? Well, Ayub <laughs> Kote. Oh, non sequitur. I like it. I'll sequit her right in the patoot. <clears throat> 
What is it you're doing? I'm trying to find the name of that story. All this must be excised. No, I'm leaving it. Versus on St. Andrews. I knew it was a St. Berrien Henderson. No, yeah, I, I used a sound like that on a podcast way back when. Before you farted on the air. I did nothing. Well, that may be one of the reasons that people like H.P. Lovecraft. <clears throat> well, that's my, my feeling as well. Okay, well, well, let's think about why I was so angry and what was it that the guy said that bothered me so much. I mean, obviously, the just because you couldn't get a date in high school. I mean, that. <sighs> but uh, this is a, a finished product. That, that, that was a tired thing, and we'd said it again and again. Um, and, you know, the, the... Okay. He's creepy. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> that your daughter? <laughs> I think I may have even... I think Starship Sofa... Ooh, you... I don't think you could hear that, could you?